Good evening. Can you hear me all right in the back? Oh, good. Good. How's everybody this evening? Uh, we'll see how you are when this is over. Uh, th this, this idea of the, um, of the Civil War, uh, states' rights, slavery, uh, the Southerners proclaiming themselves as the defenders of the Constitution, so on and so forth. Uh, let's, let's start here with John Adams. This is a good place to start. Power always follows property. Men in general in every society who are wholly destitute of property are also too little acquainted with public affairs for a right judgment and too dependent upon other men to have a will of their own. They talk and they vote as they are directed by some man of property who has attached, to their minds to, he has attached their minds to his interest. A balance of power on equal liberty and public virtue is to make the acquisition of land easy to every member of society, to make a division of land into small quantities. If the multitude is possessed of landed estates, the multitude will have the balance of power, and in that case, the multitude will take care of liberty, virtue, interest, and multitude in all acts of government. John Adams. Now, there's a lot of truth to that, isn't there? Land. Land has always been a determinant of power. Yet, when you get to the American Revolution, uh, you know, I mean, when I went to school, you probably got the same thing. You know, the, the revolution was fought for liberty, freedom. Yeah, I got that stuff too. Well, let's understand something. There's two major reasons you're going to have a fight in the first place. One's money, the other's land. You know, your revolution is based largely on what? Private property. That's what, that's what Adams is telling you. You know, the wide ownership of land is conducive to a functioning system of representative government. That's what he's telling you. Isn't that what's going to fuel something we learned in school called manifest destiny, right? Right, of course it did. Manifest destiny. Interesting here, when, when you step back and take a look in this era here, uh, you know, when the British, the French, the Spanish, so on and so forth, took over somebody's land, what do they do? They planted a flag. This I'm claiming for my monarch, right? That's how empires started here. However, keep in mind the American empire was, was really perpetuated here by people like yourself. That was, you were the engines of American imperialism. It was people who thought they couldn't make it in a city. I can always go 5, 10, 20, 50, 100 miles west and I can grab myself 5, 10, 20, 50, 100 acres. Free land. Well, free land. They're kicking the Indian off to get it. That's part of this. You know, whenever a movement starts, there's somebody who's going to benefit, and there's somebody who's not going to benefit. And who's not going to benefit here is the red man. This is American imperialism. We are creating a contiguous empire is what we're doing. Not like, in the end, the British the French, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Dutch. Their empires were based on what? Naval power. And there's one other country that's going to follow, well, actually, we follow their model, whether we professed it or not. We followed another model. It's called Tsarist Russia. That's a contiguous empire. They didn't need naval power. Of course, they're operating on an on a on a environment that has a lot more time zones than ours does. And so when you go back to this era for the, what's going to be called the United States, there's two things that really matter here. Number one, in 1764, the Currency Act. How many of you got that in school? I mean, you got the Tea Act, the Sugar Act, right? Didn't you get all that stuff? Of course, the Intolerable Act. You got all that stuff, right? Sure. How about the Currency Act? Keep in mind, you know, when, when you go back to this era, again, the French and Indian War, which is really what? The Seven Years' War? It was not only fought here, folks, it was also waged by the Brits and the French in India. Churchill called this the world's first real world war. Well, yeah, it's fought on two continents, but, you know, the Russians aren't really into this. It's really the British and the French, but I'm not going to argue with Winston Churchill. That might be a losing argument. But the fact of the matter is here, interesting here, you know, it would cost the British taxpayer in 1757 75,000 pounds to station British troops here. In 1763, 
it cost the British taxpayer 350,000 pounds. War. War has a tendency to do what? Drive up costs here? <laughs> and so at the same time, the colonists, believe it or not, are printing their own money. You have 13 separate colonies here, many of them printing up their own money. Now, is this money really worth a lot? No, it's not. But they're taking control of their own economic interaction. This is the growth of autonomy here. But 13 separate entities. They're not united here. 13 separate entities. However, when the British have to pay back the banks for the war, <laughs> Uh, you think they're going to be able to pay the banks back with colonial script? Yeah, how's that going to work? No, they want general, they want gold and they want silver. But the colonists don't have as much gold and silver. And so this is an issue. And so what is the crown going to do? They want the taxes paid in gold and silver, and they don't want the colonists to print their own money. That's a sign of autonomy. And so Currency Act, they can't print their own money. The next killer is, going back to the Quebec Act, when the British government tells the colonists, you can't grab, grab land anymore. Why is that? Because the Crown does not want to station troops in the outback and protect these people. Save money that way, right? But what happens when you get people who aren't making it too well in some of these small towns and the few cities that exist? Where do their economic prospects go? And so, you are going to see here, by this time, 1772, 1774, 1775, this buildup to what you call the American Revolution, which starts really, and we don't talk about it this much anymore, or at all really, that it really started as a civil war. The colonists fighting amongst themselves? We don't talk about this that way. Again, remember John Adams. Remember John Adams. At the beginning of the Revolution, the colonists were divided into three factions. Those that were blue, true blue, those that were Tories and loyalists, and those who were undecided, you know, the fence sitters. Don't you have that in every form of human endeavor, the people that can't make up their mind here? So one of the other two factions is trying to push them off the fence on their side. But here you see at the same time, something begin to develop here at the same time. You know, your Declaration of Independence, which is also a declaration of war, by the way, is not only a declaration of independence, it was that unit of cohesion to bring the 13 colonies together. That's what this is. You know, you had spontaneous uprisings in these colonies. And they're all looking after their own interests here. How do you expect to win a revolution when you have 13 spontaneous uprisings? How's that going to work? It's not going to work. It's not going to work. And so your Declaration of Independence, signed by 56 people from 13 colonies, is that effort at cohesion. But again, you've got this development going on here. You know, you're going to see the agrarian movement where? Below the Mason-Dixon line. And you're going to see the beginnings of, it's rudimentary at this point, industrialization up in the north. And so as the war is waged and finally won by the colonists, led by a general who loses more battles than he wins, George Washington. You know, there's a book for those who are interested in Vietnam. It's called On Strategy by a Colonel Harry Summers. It's too bad he's gone now. Uh, Harry Summers, was, as a colonel, led infantry in the jungles of Vietnam. But he wrote a book called On Strategy. It's not a thick, not an overly thick book. And it goes beyond leading troops in a jungle. He also discusses the constitutionality of deploying American troops. And deploying American troops at the behest of the American public. Boy, what a novel concept that is. And he's picked, by the way, to be part of Kissinger's team in Paris. And in the course of the negotiations in Paris, he's funny, uh, I remember watching him one time and he says, you know, when uh, the, these first were organized, these, these talks, uh, the Americans booked their rooms for a month, the Vietnamese booked theirs for a year. <laughs> but at the same time, during these discussions, you know, you get the breaks. And he said during one of his breaks, he met up with an opposite number. 
a colonel in the North Vietnamese Army. Well, you know, small talk, right among warriors, so to speak. And he finally says, I worked up enough gumption, <laughs> where he says, you know something? You guys never beat us on the battlefield. You know what the answer was? That may be so, but it's also irrelevant. You're here. You know, when I was doing some research up at Army Aviation Magazine in 1968-69, you know what that war was costing us? $14 million an hour, and it's a loser. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at George Washington, he outlasted the British, just like the Vietnamese outlasted us in Vietnam, and we lost. Pure and simple, we lost. We lost the political battle. And so here you begin to see something develop here in this country. You know, Thomas Jefferson, right? Jefferson. He is going to be the darling of the agrarian set. What else develops? Alexander Hamilton. He will be the darling of those who want to industrialize the country. You are seeing the two basic doctrines that are really going to really begin to split the nation here as we go along. Interesting because this idea, Jefferson's idea of the agrarian as the salt of the earth. You know who else that resonated with, believe it or not? Hitler's SS. If that organization was still around, they would have joined the Indians and the Dakotas. You think I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, Heinrich Himmler was a big proponent of the farmer as the salt of the earth. Uh, fascinating in parallel this is. And so here you begin to see as George Washington becomes president, and he sticks around for a second term, who are his two major advisors? Jefferson and Hamilton, right? Je Washington's going to spend his, uh, half of his eight years as president as a referee. As a referee. Je again, Jefferson with this notion of the agrarian as the salt of the earth. Why? The Jeffersonian faction believes, believes in elective Republican limited government. That's what they believe. They also believe, or he believes, and this will be disseminated among people who go with this agenda, that it is the person who digs in the dirt that's the best protector of Republican elective representative government. That's what they believe. Because why? They have regard for the land. Now let's go to the other side. Hamilton, right? Alexander Hamilton believes in, man, in, in, the, you know, in, in manufacturing and also slash finance. He's not stupid. He sees where the world is going. Let's understand the situation here at the time America is developing. The Industrial Revolution is in full swing. You are seeing the evolution of technology. How about capitalism? It's developing here. Coming out of Britain, going to France, obviously it's going to leach its way here. The, the, in, the interesting aspect here is you are seeing the suborning, the evisceration, and the, and the, and the shades of the impending demise of, of royalty and monarchy as the decided form of government. This is the establishment at the point here. Understand that. This is establishment. Monarchyism is establishment, which is why people like Jefferson, Thomas Paine, Patrick Henry, good Lord, these people are radicals. Republicanism, Republican form of government, is what's on the rise. Jefferson will write in 1808 that if we can take control of Cuba, that can be a jump off point to spreading Republican government south. And so when you look at these people and how royal houses are looking at us, keep in mind. This is what establishment at, at what's the establishment at this time. They are how that this is how they are viewing Lenin, Trotsky, Mao, so on and so forth. Now that's an interesting perspective too, because land is a determinant of power. Land is a determinant of power. Big here, the private property, the ownership of land. Yeah. What happens in 1848 with Marx? No, we don't want the private. We want the collective ownership of land. But again, that needs to be understood too. 
because Marx is in an area where there is no manifest destiny. People like Adams are on a continent where, yes, it will work. Big difference here, big difference. But then you have to ask the question here, why, how did capitalism, whether it's agrarian capitalism or where it's industrial capitalism, how did it take root here? And I got a uh, laundry list here. One, one of the major, and I don't care who, who argues the point against this, one of the major reasons it's going to start here, capitalism, and, and why our revolution will not be as bloody as the French. Because the French follows ours not too many years after, 1789. In fact, this year is the 230th anniversary of the French Revolution. Wow. Mm. Number one, America was spared that, that, that era of feudalism. We didn't have that here. We didn't have that here. Weren't people coming from Europe to escape the remnants of this? They were also coming here to escape something else, the Catholic Church. Keep in mind about the French Revolution, folks. It was every bit as much anti-monarch as it was anti-church. Yeah, why do you think the peasants were taking some of these bishops and giving them a haircut? And then grabbing the land and dividing it up amongst themselves. That really doesn't happen here. Thank God it didn't. Our revolution was really mild compared to the French. Our revolution was mild. But let's understand why our revolution succeeds. We're 3,000 miles from Europe. How does, where does the French Revolution compete? Or where, does, how does, where does that take place? In the belly of the beast, where we have one crown to take to, to handle. The French have, well, not only their own, the Bourbons. How about the British monarch? How about the Habsburgs? How about Tsarist Russia? You know, you know, they, and these monarchs are going to want to kill this revolution in the womb. That's why they have the French Revolution. And later on, the Great French War which is going to tear the continent apart. But at the same time here, you see the accentuation of, and I'm going to get into this before this is over with, because it makes a difference here with the South, something known as levee en masse, conscripting entire populations and entire economies for war. Interesting how monarchy is being suborned here by these ideas. But thankfully, this country was spared the fact that it's 3,000 miles from Europe. So our revolution will succeed. But we don't go through that, that, that period of feudalism and serfdom. People coming here in the 17th century, yeah, sir, some, many of them were white indentured servants, I'll give you that. But there were people coming here right from the get-go getting land. And that's how the southern aristocracy is going to start. In the Tidewater area, tobacco here, followed later on by what? Sugar, cotton, rice. It, let's not forget indigo, too. Indigo, too. And so a gentry begins to get started here. But keep in mind, since we don't have that, that, that era of serfdom here and feudalism, our revolution won't be as bloody. Because with the French, you have centuries of pent-up frustration among the peasantry. And how are you going to stop them once they're turned loose? You're not. You have to wait until this tide washes out. And guess who else? This, guess where else this will happen? 1917, Russia. Interesting. Fascinating here. The virgin landmass that was the United of America was rich with natural resources. Yeah, that goes without saying. As we're moving west, what's happening? The virgin forest, these pristine rivers, the fertile ground to grow whatever it is we need to grow, and then later feed the world. <laughs> How about the gold and silver they're going to find here? The game, pelts, so on and so forth, and our forest for timber for ships and so on and so forth. It's a Home Depot. It really is. 
America was a vast expanse of land which was to create a grand contiguous empire. I mentioned that already, but it bears repeating here. Just like Tsarist Russia. Fascinating here what you see. A development that eventually required an insatiable need for labor. Down south, what does that mean? Right. The unpaid toiler. The living and breathing property. And I'm going to get to that when I discuss the southern aristocracy next week. The American landed gentry, our version of the boyer in Russia. And the plantation system, that's a concentration camp system. That's what that was. And so, yes, you need labor. But then again, as America develops from the 18th through the 19th into the 20th century, what else develops here? The factory system? Don't we need labor for that? Of course you do. Of course you do. And you're going to see an influx of people coming in from Europe as labor here, too. That's coming. Not yet, but that's coming. Geographical location which provided a useful refuge from European machinations and war. That is a saving grace here. Why do you think later on the United States builds a two ocean navy? Right? Protect both coasts. That's coming. But we're more or less not totally isolated, but we are to a certain extent from what's going on in Europe. Plus, Americans will not have to go to Africa. They will not have to go to Asia. They will not have to go to the Middle East to go fight. Keep in mind why we are developed. One of the reasons this country develops is because in 1763, the British, you know, knowing you know, that thing, geography, that we don't seem to do good with anymore here in this country. You know National Geographic took a poll several years ago asking people where Ukraine was, and 22% said it was some small town in Indiana or Illinois. And so, interestingly enough here, interestingly enough, yes, you know, as we're developing here, the British are already moving into the Middle East. Why? Because two rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates, and they see that, you know, the beginning of the great game here between them and Russia. The Russians go down these rivers into the Persian Gulf through the Strait of Hormuz, boom, colonial India. No, we're going to move our empire west. And so that that company known as the, the British East India Company opens up, opens up an office in Basra, and then followed five years later by a British consulate, and then 1798 they're in Baghdad, followed four years by a British consulate. You know, this is when the Ottoman Empire is beginning to do this anyway. And so they're moving into the Middle East. Why do they want to come back here for if they got kicked out? They don't. They don't. India is the crown jewel of the empire. They're going to protect that by getting into the Middle East. And you know where that's eventually going to go. America then, as opposed to Europe and the Middle East, was spared the, the, the terrible constancy of, of war on a global variety. Thank God for that. America's first government was an elective republic which provided the masses with a participation in the ruling structure determining the use of land. And then Americans are an ambitious, dynamic people, and individualism was big here. Well, you had to be an individual. If you're moving west, this idea of the individual. And they're determining their own future. This is important. As they're getting land moving west, they're determining their own future. But there's an issue here, too. Again, these two doctrines, the Jeffersonian doctrine and the Hamiltonian doctrine. You know, when you go back to, when you go back to the... Um, Ordinance of 1787, which is really that starting gate here for that mass flight west. However, with these two doctrines, you know, agrarian capitalism in the south, industrial capitalism slash finance developing up in the north, there's going to be a race for land. Manifest destiny here, right? And so don't think for one moment here, you know, as this develops, you have southerners, you know, some of these plantation owners, and you have northern businessmen, and don't think they don't have the pad and pencil out here. Which areas are going to come in slave? Which are going to come in free? And here you're going to see here, as the southerners move south, deep south, and then southwest. You know, you're not going to grow cotton in Minnesota. At the same time here, 
you know, each new state that's admitted, you get two senators, right? It doesn't make any difference the size of the state. You get two senators to staff the Senate. How about the House? We're not talking about states that are cookie cutter in size, are we? We're talking about states of different sizes. And so does that mean some states are going to have more reps in the House of Representatives than other states? Of course it does. You don't think these guys don't have the pad and pencils out and they're not doing the math here? Because who controls the government controls the agenda. And that agenda is what? Land. Land. Keep in mind, again, tobacco being grown in the Tidewater area, that's interesting. They grew about 20,000 pounds of that stuff, I think it's 1696. <laughs> By the time the American Revolution, they're, at, they're exporting anywhere from, I think, I believe it was 35 to 80 million pounds a year. Boy, these Europeans are really smoking up a storm. You know who was against that? George III. Nasty, smelly stuff. Yeah, it's nice to count the money, though. Nice to count the money, but these are the other crops too, but cotton. Cotton you need 200 frostless days to process. Which is why, you can still drive down North Carolina, can't you, and find the cotton growing here? But it's better in South Carolina, it's better in Georgia, it's going to be better in Arkansas or Alabama. How about Mississippi and Louisiana? 200, don't you get frost in North Carolina? Don't you get cold? cold that, of course you do. So is cotton better grown in the other areas? Yes. What does that mean? More plantations. The plantation system spreads. And since in 188, your, your Congress here, well, not your Congress, but Congress at the time, uh, passed legislation. No more importation of slaves. What? No big deal. They're breeding them at this point. They're breeding them. Why are they breeding them? Because there has, there's going to be more plantations. And what are they doing when they're breeding them? They're leasing them, selling them, so on and so forth. Harriet Tubman, remember her? She was one of nine kids. Three of her brothers and sisters are going to be taken from their parents and sold off to new plantations. What is that? Human trafficking of a sort? Which is why she escaped, not me and she became an ardent abolitionist. It's a sordid trafficking. Pulling kids away from their parents and then just selling them off. But the system has to be perpetuated here. Why? You want the tobacco, you want the cotton, you want the rice, you want the sugar. Now interestingly enough, as these plantations spread, and as more states uh, you know, in the central or northern part are coming in free, that competition is going on. You know, going into the 19th century, 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, so on and so forth. And it's accentuating the split that's growing here. These two major doctrines, more so than, than, than a discussion of states' rights, more so than slavery itself, and this notion the Southerners like to perpetuate, they were the real defenders of the Constitution, not really. You know, it's these two doctrines that are competing here. And they are deciding which course your nation's going to go. That's what you are seeing here. The Jeffersonian notion and the Hamiltonian, and this is going to transcend or go on after their death, after their deaths. Because keep in mind, as Jefferson and Hamilton and people like this pass into the, into the, into the, into the, into the dustbin of history here, and that's had some to a couple of other people, Henry Clay and John C. Calhoun, aren't some colleges taking their names off and you know, they want their statues down, so on and so forth, right? Let's understand something. These guys were ardent Southerners. At the same time, they didn't want the nation pulled apart. When they're dead, you're going to get people like William Lowndes Yancey, Robert Barnwell Rhett, Ed, uh, Edmund, 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 Edmund Young, I think his name was. I, I have to get up his name. These were ardent Southerners who hated the North. You've gone from Jefferson to Clay and Calhoun and now to these guys who have no use for the North. And I'm going to get to them later on. They're ardent Southern. Robert Barnwell Rhett's interesting. That really sounds like a Southern name, doesn't it? What is that, what is that conjure Im images of Robert Barnwell Rhett? His real name was Smith. 
but they were ardent Southerners, and they're going to carry this doctrine to a radicalization of the South. And I'm going to get into this when we get to the, to, to the third talk here. They're a fascinating group. In fact, um, Edmund Ruffin, that's his name. Uh, William, uh, Edmund Ruffin was an older gent at the time here, just to give you a preview. And he, fight, he pulled the first lanyard when the Confederates attacked Fort Sumter. And he used to go to these different battlefields where the Confederate Army were fighting. And he'd pull the lanyards on some of the cannons. The guy's over 60. He's pulling the lanyards on these cannons. And then when the battles are over, he would walk the battlefield to see how many Federals his shells had killed. Now, there's something wrong with this guy. But again, this Jeffersonian versus Hamiltonian notion. Interesting here, you know, I was, I was, when I was doing some research on this, what I found about um, yeah, uh, Jefferson. This is what Jefferson believes in. Interesting. This comes from his writings. The sage of the planters and booster of limited government. Thomas Jefferson saw the agrarian not only as the salt of the earth, but as the savior of limited government, of republican government. The farmer's appreciation, no, rather his affinity for land would ensure that, the, that he be the proper caretaker of representative government as opposed to, and these are Jefferson's words, those tinsel aristocrats as businessmen, speculators, and bankers. Indeed, if Americans traded their farms for factories, the resulting urbanization would see to the violation of the land within slums of the mushrooming cities. For the factory workers living atop one another were the real enemies of republicanism, the panderers of vice, and the instruments by which the liberties of a country are generally overturned. That's Jefferson. How much of a regard did he have for the factory worker, right? Hamilton, on the other hand, oh, that's a lot of bunk. This is what he says about Jeffersonians, uh, Jefferson's ideas. An agrarian republic of mild laws and equal opportunity, asylum to the oppressed, and beacon light of freedom, renouncing wealth and commerce to preserve simplicity and equality. To Hamilton, all this was sentimental and mischievous nonsense. Hamilton believed that the only choice for America lay between a stratified society like in Britain. Well, you know, the Hamiltonians catered to the Brits, the Jeffersonians catered to the French, right. And so, uh, as, uh, be, for an English model, as opposed to, and this is what Jefferson, this is what Hamilton calls Jefferson's notion of American society, a squalid mobocracy. Their way of using the English language is to be admired here. It truly is. It truly is. Yet, interesting what else Hamilton notes, you know, when you talk about society here, how he sees it, that all societies divide themselves into two main classes. First, there's the rich and the well-born, then the mass. The mass are too tempestuous, too unpredictable to rule. Leave therefore, leave therefore to the, the first class a permanent stake in rule as they will forever steady the mass. You believe that? You believe that? That I find absolutely fascinating. Then you get Adams who says, the wide ownership of land is required for a functioning system of representative government. You don't think land doesn't make a difference here? It did here for the Jeffersonian agenda as well as the Hamiltonian agenda. And what you're going to see develop here is as the Southerners really get, you know, I mean, these, these crops they're growing underpins the American economy here. We're not an industrialized state yet. And so these crops are actually going to, I'm talking again, cotton, to, cotton tobacco, rice, sugar, right? The, ma the, main, the, main, the main crops here. And however, where are most of the factories going to develop that are going to process this stuff for export? The north, right? And so as they, and the, and the, and the southerners are happy about you know, being able to market their crops, but then again, 
as the northern factories develop to process these crops for export, is that really suborning the Jeffersonian notion here? Yes, it is. Are the southerners beginning to cut their own throats here? Yes, they are. Do many of them understand this? Probably not at this point. Probably not. And so as this goes along, the Jeffersonian notion of the farmer, it's not the farmer that's going to control the politics. Like anything else man starts here, it's going to be the few who control the many. And that's going to be who? The plantation owner. Too much land going into too few hands. And to give you an inkling of what's coming here, by 1860, the average small farmer will be worth, one, down, in, down below the Mason-Dixon line, worth over $1,700. The average plantation owner will be worth over $24,700. Who owns the economy? Who owns the political agenda? The plantation owner. Yes? That's right. So how did, how do you, if it works, now if you have a certain amount of money, I think was the way that they're telling you, if you didn't have a vote, but you had property or votes of a specific amount. Hence the great race for land west. Because the more people that have land, guess what? And so, it, and so you bring up, a, that's a brilliant point because of the fact, you go into the early uh, 1820s, there's a man in, in England, his name is Robert Owen. He's one of those utopian socialists. And he had that socialist experiment in Scotland. Uh, and, and it worked where he, he lowered, he lowered the, the, the prices in the general stores and he raised people's wages and people were living together, working together, they're happy. There's no manifest destiny here. These people are subject to who? The bourgeoisie capitalist factory owners, right? That's what they're susceptible to. These people like this. They have predictability. They're making a few bucks. They're now eating. And, he, and he, lowered the, he lowered the hours per day working from 17 to 10. How do you like that one? They became healthier. You know what happened? Owen brings that here to Indiana. And it's going to consume 80% of his wealth. He buys 30,000 acres in New Harmony, Indiana. And he tries this experiment here. It falls flat on its face. Why? Why do I need socialism for? I can go grab 50 acres and, and, and do this on my own. What do I need that for? And so it doesn't work. However, it's not till the end of the 19th century you begin to see people, what, have a gravitation of socialism here? Don't, don't you see that startup? Eugene Debs, so on and so forth, right? Yeah, so that's a brilliant point because there was always that land over the next hill for me to grab and then make my own way. The land, it's the land. But then again, when you step back and look at the larger picture, again, the main doctrines here, the Jeffersonian and the Hamiltonian for control of what? Congress, do the math. And to give you an example here, in 1826, there was a Congress down in South America. These, these new uh, Central and South American republics wanting to form some supranational organization on an economic basis, on a military basis to protect themselves. And guess what? They had outlawed slavery. Well, Congress is the, well, shouldn't we send a couple of representatives down to this Congress? Guess who doesn't want to send anybody? The South. Why? Because these countries had abolished slavery. They filibustered. By the time the North defeated the filibuster, this Congress is almost over. They sent two representatives down. One dies en route. And this congressman named Sargent made it. And guess what? It's over. And the British sent representatives, not, not you know, just the observers, so to speak, observers. They inked a lot of trade deals with these republics at our expense. But the Southerners filibustered. Why? Because these countries had outlawed slavery. And slavery was what? The engine of the agrarian agenda in the South. 
or what you're later going to call the Confederacy. And so when you begin to see, when you begin to see the South, you know, begin to secede here, uh, this revolution, which, uh, which uh, you'll, you'll, as the handouts come on here, you're going to see this is, not a revol this is not a liberal revolution. This is a revolution from the right. It is to preserve the primacy of the planter. And the idea is to destroy northern influence here. That's what this revolution's about. That's what this revolution, it's a revolution from the right because this notion about the Southerners being the defenders of states' rights, the defenders of the real, the real, the real defenders of the Constitution, oh, that's a lot of hogwash because of the fact you're going to have 9 million people down south, check that, 5 million whites, nearly 4 million living and breathing property who can't vote. What happened to consent of the governed here? That's where you're going. So states' rights, yeah, for the whites. Defenders of the Constitution, yeah, for the whites, but what happened to everybody else here? <laughs> yes? Uh, in the question of the land, can you also clarify the role of the Louisiana Purchase? Uh -huh. uh, this uh, over night you won uh, bingo, you know, million land. And oh, yeah. Like, uh, yeah, that goes back to, uh, in part, to the successful revolution of blacks on Haiti. Toussaint Louverture, uh, they threw the French out, right? And so the French lost a lot of the sugar plantations. And sugar is almost like golden. That's another thing the Europeans had a sweet tooth besides smoking it up. And so, yes, they lost. Now, if he lost all, some of the plantations, you know, the French did, uh, the, Napoleon at this point, because he's the successor of the French Revolution, how are they supposed to station those troops in Louisiana territory? Now, that's the point. And so if he's going to go to war in Europe to start his empire here, he needs money. So what happens? He sells the Louisiana territory. And America will, what, grow twice the size overnight. Is that an accelerator for manifest destiny? Yeah, it sure is. And it's for 15 million bucks, three cents an acre. What a deal. Try buying land today for three cents an acre, see what it gets you. And so it's a 15 mil, however, it's 11,250,000 in cash. The rest was 3,750,000 in debts owed by French to Americans. Well, that money never leaves the country. But 11,250 grand is not a bad take back then. And so he's able to finance his, his conquests in, in Western Europe. And so. But yeah, it helps. You know, so Jefferson will double the size of the country overnight. That's a huge swath of territory. And since the Spanish are to the west of that, they know what's coming. They know what's coming. It's almost like the darn French sold us out. And so interesting what you're seeing here, because at the same time, the British are moving into the Middle East. Napoleon's going to what? take control of Western Europe. And yet when America goes to war with the British in 1812, there will be a British admiral who says, you know, there were a number of British businessmen who didn't want that war. They wanted business with us. And yet one British admiral is going to say, it's a shame America went to war because there's one thing they don't seem to understand, that the Royal Navy is the Alps for the United States. Because if Napoleon defeats us, what's to stop him from coming back here and grabbing the Louisiana Territory? Wow. Interesting here. Fascinating. But that Louisiana Purchase obviously helps to accelerate that land, that race for the land here. I mean, that's what it is. This is a race. This is a race. Because the Southerners are convinced, remember bloody Kansas. If the Northerners can stop us from grabbing land in Kansas, how long is it going to be before they stop slavery in South Carolina, in Georgia, in Louisiana, so on and so forth? Let's get out. And they're going to go. They're going to go. Yes? When the Louisiana Purchase um, was consummated here, oh, the Spanish knew we were going to grab Florida. And there were many Americans who at the time said, 
wow, we're going to get Florida. We can go to, we can complete going to the deep south. We'll get Florida. And you know what John Adams was saying? He said, Florida's fine, but that's not the, that's not the prize. The prize is west. But the Spanish knew they're done. They're done. And so Florida will be subsumed here, um, you know, be, uh, prior to our real expansion going on here west. That was easy, that one was. And interestingly enough, when you add to this uh, many blacks escaping Georgia, where did they go? Florida. And they made it up with the Seminole Indians who finally found an ally here. Of course, what's going to happen, what happen when Andy Jackson shows up? Right, exactly. You know, that's a dead end. It's a dead end street, Florida is. So it's only a matter of time before America absorbs it. They absorb the swamp. Really? Yes? That was, a, that was that virgin territory near the Ohio River Valley, right? Yeah. Right. And, States. beg your pardon? There were five states that got annexed. Correct. They, well, when they, when they were prognosticating this, they thought three to five states, mm -hmm. and, they, and, it's, and, it's, and it's believed that once a territory has 60,000 residents or people or occupants, whatever you want to call them, they can apply for statehood. Right. And so, and, and if you read your constitution, that they will be given, they will be, uh, they will be guaranteed a Republican constitution. You won't find the word democracy in your constitution once. You won't find it. 